Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Lori Black. I'm the Associate Director of the Lowell Milken Center for American uh, for Music of American Jewish Experience at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. And we are thrilled to have you join us for some music and conversation with tonight's guest, world-renowned klezmer clarinetist and klezmer community leader, Michael Winograd. To make sure that you know about all of our uh, upcoming programming related to music of the American Jewish experience, please make sure you're on our event email list. You'll find the link in the uh, mail for the mailing list in the chat below, or simply Google UCLA Jewish Music, and we will be the first thing that you find. Tonight, I have the pleasure of speaking with Michael Winograd. Based in Brooklyn, New York, Michael spends much of his time in transit performing and teaching throughout the world. He is one third of the Transatlantic uh, Klezmer Cabaret Collective Yiddish Art Trio, clarinetist of Terrace Band, a classic 1950s Jewish American tribute group, and the co-founder and director of the groundbreaking borderless world fusion band Sundare. Michael also collaborates with cantor Yaakov Yankee Lemmer and klezmatics trumpeter Frank London and Ahava Rabah, a group that explores the spiritual sides of Ashkenazi Jewish music. He has played alongside Itzhak Perlman, the Klezmer Conservatory Band, So Called, Budowitz, Alicia Spiegels, and more. Along with revered Pakistani vocalist Zeb Bangash, Michael received the prestigious Matt Fund uh, Fellowship for their work in Sundare. Additionally, he was awarded a commission from Chamber Music America in 2014 to compose The Pomegranate of Sistan, a collection of musical settings of the contemporary Urdu poetry. The full work was premiered by Sundare in the spring of 2016, Michael was also given a fellowship from the New York Foundation of the Arts in 2015. With a degree from the New England Conservatory of Music, Michael is an avid arranger and record producer. In 2015, Michael arranged a program for Symphony Nova Scotia featuring the dynamic Canadian singer-songwriter Ben Kaplan. Michael also provides orchestrations for Kaplan's most recent records, Birds with Broken Wings, and has produced records for Adrian Cooper, Susan Levitin, Miriam uh, K. Siegel, Jeff Warshower, and Deb Strauss, uh, uh, who will be we will be featuring uh, in the coming months, and Josh Waletsky, among others. As an educator, Michael has taught seminars and workshops at many of the hubs for Klezmer uh, development, including Klez Camp, Klez, uh, Klez Canada, Yiddish Summer Weimar, Firth Klezmer Festival, Paris Klezmer Workshop. The list goes on and on. Uh, I first had the opportunity to meet Michael at Yiddish New York, um, and then again at Klez Canada, where he serves as artistic director. So without further ado, I want to introduce you all to Michael Winograd, who we will be speaking to you tonight. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It's so nice to see you all, actually see you all in <laughs> these Brady Bunch style boxes. Yeah. Hello, everybody in the Brady Bunch style boxes. Um, it still looks like that, doesn't it? Even yeah, a year later. Yeah. It's a year um, of Brady Bunch. A year of Brady Bunch. <laughs> uh, so this album slash concert that we're going to be spending most of the time tonight looking at, it comes from the world of Brady Bunch, doesn't it? Um, can you just, we're, we're going to jump into some music, but just quickly give us uh, an overview of what we're going to be looking at tonight and how it came together. Okay. Um, well, it's... Uh... It, it, it was a, uh, it's a it's a very pandemic uh, pandemic project because uh, in um, it was April and um, I wanted to play a concert and I knew that was going to be really difficult uh, so uh, I can go more into it later but uh, yeah. and, and go and go into all the technical details but more or less the idea was to put together a full concert program that would be filmed and recorded uh and in april that was a very daunting task it took me until june to get it out but um it was uh and i was so um i'd spent so much time over the last couple of years concertizing dave Terrace's music that i figured it was uh it was time for me to 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 go a little backwards and uh and go to Fantastic. the and well let's hear the first the track from the album uh freight i Hello friends, it's so nice to see you. I'm oh, Michael Winograd and welcome huh? to my home. <laughs> nice. I hope you're all doing well and ready to have some fun because that's what's in store for you tonight. And who knows, you might just learn something too. So what do you say? Should I bring out the band and get this show started? Yeah! Let's do it. Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> Thank you. 
so much fun to hear that. Um, so let's quickly just start off by, for the uh, for the uninitiated and, and and no shame if this is your first time hearing the name Naftuli Bronvine. But in April of last year, not many people were thinking to make an album of all Naftuli Bronvine tunes. So let's answer the two questions as to who is Nifty Bronwine? Why why is he so important? Why do we still record his music? And uh, where was the idea of coming uh, creating an album coming from? Um, okay, uh, so Bronwine was a Ukrainian-born clarinet player who um, was the first uh, kind of superstar uh, recording artist of uh, instrumental Yiddish music in the United States. Uh, he started recording in New York, um, yeah, as a soloist. There were there were some bands that were that that had some that were certainly uh, ha- had some exposure, but uh, as a soloist, he was kind of the first of the of the superstars. Uh, I think he started recording in New York around 1917. Might be a year off, but I don't think I am. I think 1917 is the first recording I can think of of his. Um, and just a wild clarinet player, uh, and, and uh, where other clarinetists who came after him almost kind of grounded the style a little more and became a little more regular. Um, he was he was kind of all over the place in all the best ways. He was an improviser, so um, you know the classic line that everyone says, which is kind of sounds a little cheesy, but is completely true, is that he never played anything the same way twice, and that's that's true. And I've been slowing down his recordings and transcribing them for, you know, 20 plus years, and I can vouch for that. Uh, every every repetition of every phrase is always different, and he, and he used um, what we call extended techniques on the, on the, on the clarinet, not, not the things that you learn in your clarinet lessons at home. You know, these different fingerings and these different sounds and these different ways of manipulating the instrument to... Um, to sound uh, to get a, a certain you know attitude and sound and and uh, and style, and on top of that, his repertoire was just slamming. He played. He had these tunes. I don't think that any of the tunes we uh, we when we say Brandwine tunes, we're not talking about that he composed them necessarily, um, but uh, they were just such such great repertoire and. and you know, many of them were, you know, Jewish Eastern European tunes, but also he would throw these Turkish tunes into his repertoire, but play them in this Jewish way that was so exciting and really ended up, you know, um, spawning a subgenre of the music that became very much part of the tradition in New York following. So he was, a, uh, you know, he was the first kind of, you know, he was like the original Jimi Hendrix of Klezmer um, in that time. And, um, you know, only a few years later, Dave Harris came on the scene, and Dave Harris was a much more structured musician, could read music, was more flexible in other styles, and that uh, a lot, and and so he was able to you know play in the Yiddish theater and do all this other stuff, and it made him a, uh, a more of a commodity. Um, but uh, there's something about Brandwine's playing that has never been replicated by anyone following uh, to this day. That we all no, one, no one has ever sounded like Brandwine, and um, and that is uh, that's a testament to his playing. So um, I, you know, uh, you know, he was his, his repertoire was some of the first stuff that I learned. Uh, his recordings were some of the first recordings I learned when I was getting into klezmer music. And um, returning to and I've never it's not as if I ever stopped listening to them, but thinking about them as a full length uh, uh, a full length program, this was the first time I had done that. And um, I don't know necessarily, I didn't really think about it as necessarily an album. I just wanted to put on a concert, but then it became clear to put it out as a, as a record. Um, and it seemed like a good, you know, you look for things that will help you um, tie a program together, as opposed to just playing a bunch of tunes, which is also great. But in this setting, it was the second, it was the first, you know, when I started thinking about this and working on it, it was the second month of the pandemic. And um, I was already growing, uh, you know, uh, tired of just sitting around and doing random live streams that I didn't have a a direction with. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was kind of where the idea came from. 
Fantastic. Well, let's go ahead and we're going to have a listen to the next track um, on this set. So uh, we're going to have a listen to Hora mit Sibilis uh, going into Zurich ver uh, von der Mil uh, Milchoma. Excuse me. My Yiddish isn't great. <laughs> uh, here we go. Thank you. 
having some flashbacks to bar mitzvahs in my youth. <laughs> um, so that fantastic track. And it's also just so clear that you and your colleagues had so much fun um, in the making of this. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind real quick, if you could just identify who are these awesome musicians beside yourself that we're hearing, because it's a, an all-star cast. Um, and then tell us a little bit about some of the humor <laughs> and some of the, the just the goofiness that we, we get to hear in, in this. Um, okay. Well, the musicians are uh, some of my regular, my regulars who I have really not played in person with in over a year, um, all except for one, actually. Um, so that's um, uh, Will Holzhauser on accordion. Uh, and um, Dan Blacksburg on the trombone, and Zoe Gigano on the bass, and Richie Barche on the drums, and I was pulling double duty on clarinet and piano. Uh, but I didn't put any of myself playing piano in there because there's only so many boxes that you could really get on the screen. Um, as far as the imagery um, is what I think you're getting at about the humor, um, I am. Uh, I was just, you know, thinking about what is going to hold people's attention for an hour-long program, and um, and I've always been. Uh, I mean, you know, people. It's surprising what people will put on YouTube, <laughs> and it's surprising what you'll find on YouTube. Um, and so I am uh, kind of when I'm making things like this, I just you know, explore what the world has to give me through through search engines. And uh, so I spent a lot of time just watching crazy videos on YouTube it, when it, I was preparing. It adds so much life and personality yeah. to the video. So, I, mean... I, one, so I, I spent one day, maybe six hours or so, watching videos of, of, of people uh, chopping onions and peeling onions. And I found the best one was this one from a guy in India. Did you see? That was not sped up. That was real time. That was time. expert onion chopping. That and was real time. Everyone didn't onion. get the joke. Horamit Sibilis, Sibilis being onions. <laughs> yeah. And it was, and, I, the, and the video goes on longer, too. I mean, it was fantastic. And so that one won. But I did. I have, like, a bunch of other videos that I saw of people chopping onions but that was the that one was uh, along with it being impressive it was also really beautifully shot it was like the the colors of the the that 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 red onion just looks amazing so um it was real and you the, the with the, the knife work was really something and then the other one which is the one that i really spent a lot of time with is that people posted their old videos of weddings and bar mitzvahs from, I found ones from the early 70s and, and a whole bunch from the 80s and 90s, and uh, a couple of them made the cut. Um, this bar mitzvah from, I think it was 1993, made the cut. Um, and just, I mean, I you know, it's kind of weird to use other people's videos in your <laughs> concert i know that that's really creepy and um but i hope that they would take it as a compliment uh, um, uh but uh and it really did help uh you know one of the things is that uh, this style of um not with the uh putting the onion chopping in the uh, and and you know other people's home videos in your concert but this idea of this split screen editing style is um is very much of it's a thing of right now and um and i had been doing it uh previously to the pandemic i had done some stuff like this we had a uh, as a promotional thing with Clez canada we did these international jam sessions a couple times where we had people all over the world play their parts and i edited them together something i've done before um but i realized right at the beginning of the pandemic that this style was gonna feel old to me very quickly if it wasn't addended with something um like a whole concert of just that even if you're cutting away to individual players and groupings and different patterns is sounds exhausting just to my eyes you know uh so i i definitely wanted to add in a whole bunch of elements if i was going to do a full-length concert um which is what this was uh so uh you know, using other video footage um, 
really was uh was helpful and uh and you know also just like there's nothing that pleases me more than old footage of bar mitzvahs and weddings from the 70s and the 80s and the early 90s so well in, in terms of adding in different things to a concert this this uh next clip really really does that so i think would you mind just setting us up a little bit because the first half of this is not music uh but sets us up for the music <laughs> which one are we on again uh the honga oh, oh okay um so um i added a, i wanted a um we recorded the music first for all of this uh so i'll just kind of explain how the music went went down um and i can and after this i'll maybe show you guys the uh some technical stuff because i think it's interesting but um i started this with just um uh because i I wanted to do this program and i was just going to do it myself accompanying you know playing clarinet and playing piano split screen two of me and then uh richie told me that he had finally decided to get into home recording and he had taken some lessons with our pal Don Godwin, great engineer, has done lots of stuff with me. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and he had his home recording set up. I was like, great, do you want to do this brand wine thing with me? And he's like, yeah. And then so Richie recorded his, so I gave him the whole set, um, like uh, straight through all of the music in one, in one go. And the first thing he came back to me, he's like, this is the first, I, I haven't played 45 minutes straight you know and at the time this seemed like a long time he's like i haven't played 45 minutes straight in almost a month and a half <laughs> and we're like or two months and we're like yeah 13 months try that uh but um and then so he did it i was like oh that sounds really great you know it would sound really great to get zoe to play bass on it and all of a sudden yeah you know where this is going then i got will and then i got dan and all of a sudden i'd hired my whole band back um and uh and so we had we had everyone kind of record their parts all the way through that was what was fun except besides me and you could tell because i have changing outfits throughout but uh everyone else did theirs in one pass which was really cool uh so they all they all did they they all did that but and after i got all the music together the first part was you know mixing the music um just the the audio of it um and so and i'll show you how how i did that afterwards but um then I started wanting to involve some other people. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was like, you know, you remember the early pandemic when, when it was really fun to talk to people? <laughs> and when you really wanted to stay in touch with everyone? Yeah, I know that faded by like May, but like in those first couple months, you know, it was really... Uh, and so I, um, I have a couple of different... Uh, I have a bunch of guests throughout this, um, throughout the program in different ways. And uh, one of them was uh, my pal Adam Moss, who is an old roommate of mine from from some years back and he uh like many people during the pandemic i didn't have this but i'm sure many of the folks on uh the session right now um uh uh uh, uh, got into a bread making phase (laughs) you know sourdough became like like the new thing and and bagel making became the new thing and adam just started getting he basically he's a great fiddler <clears throat> no gigs like all of us uh so uh he just started making like a couple dozen bagels a day um and so i was like well that sounds like a fun thing to be in the video so why don't you take one of the songs that we did and why, why don't you film pardon me <coughs> why don't you film yourself doing the process so he gave me all this video of him and i edited it down and i put it i put it i put it to one of the uh one of the one of the songs that we recorded so um and then are are you including the intro to that too yes Yes, with the fantastic anyway enjoy here's one of the other segments (laughs) at home in the kitchen Adam Moss. Great to be here, Michael. Nice to see you. I'm so glad that you could join me tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell me, how have you been? Ah, you know, been up and down, but you know, things go round and round, kind of like bagels. Oh, that's a that's good. That's a seg. That's a segue, huh? <laughs> I like segues. Thank you. Well, all right. If you want to jump right into it, we can do so. Well, I love to talk bagels. I know. You do love to talk bagels. And apparently, from what I'm told, you love to make bagels, too. 
uh, has been a newfound passion for me. So, Adam, I have a very diverse and eclectic audience, as you know. I do. And not all of them are in the loop. So for those who might not know, tell us the bagel. What is it and who eats it? Well, uh, a bagel is a round piece of bread with a hole in it. Um, There's many methods to put a hole in bread. Um, You can either roll it out, roll it in a circle, and roll it together. Or you can take a ball, you can flatten it out, and put a hole in it. I do both methods. I still, uh, I'm still figuring out which one I like best. But uh, that's a bagel. Um, what was the other question? Who eats these things? Oh, mostly Jews, but also some Goyim. Goyim love bagels. Usually they like blueberries in them with uh, fruity cream cheese and sweets. Um, I prefer mine with cream cheese and smoked fish. Sable, if I can afford it, if I'm feeling spendy. Um, Sable's not easy to come by during uh, quarantine times, but, you know, if you can find it, I say put a sable on your bagel. Nice. I like that. Put a sable on your bagel. That's going to be, when I start my uh, Moss's Bagels, that's going to be my catchphrase. Very good. I approve. So here's here's another question, and, and this is a three-part question. Okay. One, why bagels? Two, why now? And three, why you? That's a very good three-part question, Michael, and I would like to give a three-part answer, if you don't mind. Please. Um, why bagels? Why not? Why now? Why whenever? When has anybody ever gotten to a bagel that said, you know what? It's about time I start making bagels. It's COVID-19. There's a quarantine on. If there wasn't a better time to learn the bagel, I don't know it. I missed one of them. What was the third one? Why you? Why me? Why not me? Fair enough. So, Adam, how do you make a bagel? Make a bagel? I could tell you, or I could just show you.
I think everybody at home, it, I, I'm going to speak on behalf of everyone and say that we are all hungry now. Um, those looked delicious and wonderful playing. <laughs> Yeah, they, they it were really make... is fun though to to get. I mean, it not to say it takes you away from the music by any means, but it's just it, I could see how this would work to really keep and engage the the audience in a completely different way. Um, it, it was just funny seeing some of the uh, comments coming in, uh, drooling. Uh, I would like to order a dozen of Moss's bagels. Second that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, he's he's still really into it. <laughs> it's given him, it's given him a new purpose. Uh, by the way, you could check out his. He has a great act. Him and his twin brother, the Brother Brothers, fantastic <laughs> music uh, coming from them. Absolutely. So uh, he's not just a bagel baker and a you know questionable interviewee. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so we're going to get into some of the some of the more technical side of this, and you're going to play yeah. a little bit uh, live for us. So I'll let you take that away. Yeah. Okay. So uh, which? Uh, sorry, I'm not looking at the set list. Which one did I? Do? Uh, Fifteen years away. Into oh, okay. So I could play that one a little bit, but I could also show you a bit of um, how this whole thing works, and maybe if you're if you're interested in seeing that. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Great. So. Um, so I am going to share a screen. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share this screen. And what you're seeing here on this screen is how it all came together audio-wise. Um, so often when you make a recording, I mean, we're all, any of us who have made recordings before are used to this idea of overdubbing and adding in parts. But generally, it's great if you can all be in the same room or at least some of you could be in the same room we did not have that luxury so um so uh we have so these are all each of the different colors represents a different a different musician and the uh, what the original thing that went around was was this um was just the clarinet and the piano so this is what i sent to everyone i sent them this uh He was the first one to, uh... So I got the drums in, because he recorded his part first. And this is when we thought that it would be really good to, to, uh, to add the bass in. Let's see, what did I do with the bass? Right. And you know where this is going. Then we got Will to record some accordion. And one thing that was really cool about doing it this way um, was that now I have like all of these solo tracks. So it's like if I need to teach someone how to play a good waltz on drums, all I got to do is show them this. Like there, that is a good klezmer waltz and a nice Turkisher. So I have, it's actually um, been a really helpful resource. Um, and when we talk about this other release that I did recently, I'll come back to it uh, in a little bit. But um, as much as um, as much as you want to be in the same room and you want to be working with people, um, there's uh, there are some silver linings to this, you know, to doing things this way. And um, and this was a great learning opportunity for me. So anyway, I'm going to play you this this medley. Um, and uh, what I need to do in order to get it set up properly is take out the clarinet that was originally in it. So I'm going to do that there. And I need to mute my talkback mic. So my voice is going to be softer. I just have to deal with it for a little bit.
We're not hearing the mic, uh, the the clarinet. Okay, I'm gonna do this. The oh, I see why, because I have it muted. That probably that probably doesn't help. Let's try that again. You know what? We live in weird times these days. You, we can, uh, you know, we we can. Do I think it. we all understand. <laughs> yeah. Let's try that one more time, shall we? That's better. There you go. Thank you so much. So now you were kind of just like part of a of a recording session. That's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm. Uh, I want to be cognizant of time. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, and and knowing that we're we're starting to get towards the point where we want to um, jump to the Q and A. Uh, I I thought. First, we could go ahead and um, take a look. You had mentioned the other project that this led into. So do you want to go ahead and just talk a little bit about that real quick? Yeah, I'll give the two-minute version of it, sure. um, which was that uh, <clears throat> sometime, let's see, what month are we in now? We are in March. Um, sometime in, in uh, probably late January, my friends from Vienna who put together um, a bunch of uh, klezmer programming out there asked me to do a concert, which I just did uh, a couple nights ago for them. Uh, and uh, they said, you can do whatever you want. So I figured I would make some backing tracks, uh, MIDI backing tracks. Um, and so I made a whole, a whole set. 
and um, and then I but I, I got them done really quickly and I was and I didn't want to wait for the concert so I started making them uh, I did them as live streams as Facebook live streams um, and I did four four days in a row I did I broke it up into four like 25 minute segments and I got a whole bunch of people who said is it possible to get the backing tracks because um, possible to get the backing tracks because uh, we haven't played music with anyone in months and it would be really great so I decided to uh, put them up uh, on Bandcamp as a play-along record, where I released it as um, two versions. There's one with me playing and one without me playing. So you could find it on, uh, on Bandcamp. It's uh, called Michael Winograd Plays By Himself. And um, I could talk a whole hour about that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. But just to say that there may very well be a volume two and potentially even a volume three coming out because it seems like a lot of people are enjoying it and you all have the inside track and what i'm hoping is that some folks will will also record along with it and make videos of themselves playing with those uh uh with those tracks so uh you can if you want to go on Bandcamp, uh i keep the price low there are only 10 bucks um and you get all of the songs that are part of that program but um i just think it's fun to be able to provide a band for folks and anyway, yeah you mentioned band camp uh right. now is the time to to say it and say it loud that it is important to support artists and support and and buy the music that is being created band camp is an amazing resource if i remember correctly on fridays they still do band are they still doing band camp fridays as well it's the first friday of every month Okay, first Friday of every month, where uh, more of the proceeds go to the artist. So do, but it's always good to be supporting artists. So Michael, your stuff is available on Bandcamp. Uh, would we find your stuff anywhere else, or is that where we find? That's a good. That's a good place to do it. Uh, for the Kosher Style record, you can order physical copies. But for the Brand Wine program, and for the Play Along record, and for another weird thing I did earlier on in the quarantine called Quarantine Songs, which is. A whole lot. So of good. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, it's, you could just, uh, discover that for yourself. Uh, that's all available as digital download. It would be great at Bandcamp. And it's a great place. And, um, uh, you know, also, there's so many good artists in this field who are putting out stuff on that platform these days. It's a real, uh, it's a real great, great thing. So, um, yes, support, support the scene. You know, it's a one hundred percent. It's how the it, scene survives, it, especially these days. Uh, it's a it's a big deal. So um, I would highly uh, recommend. But now is a great time to buy Klezmer records, Yiddish records on Bandcamp. For various artists. Yeah. So we, I think we have time for one more tune before we jump into uh, our Q and A. And if any of you have questions for Michael, now is the time. Please go ahead and put them in the chat. Or if you want to hold on to them and ask them personally after the last tune, uh, that is to that is totally possible as well. Uh, but yeah, feel free to start dropping them dropping them in the chat now. Um, why don't we listen to just being that we have to uh, shorten this? Maybe Naftuli uh, Spielis Nochemol. Yeah, sure thing. Spiel es noch einmal, spiel es noch einmal, spiel es noch einmal. Spiel es noch einmal, spiel es noch einmal, spiel es noch einmal.
Fantastic. All right. Well, we have a couple of questions coming in. So um, I see a question uh, from Bess. Do you edit the videos? Yes, I did all of the editing, the audio and the videos. So on top of recording a full length concert, you also made a full length movie yourself. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was honestly, it was a, a pretty, pretty huge learning experience. I, w as I've said a number of times, I wish I knew, I, w I wish I knew what I learned from this before I did it <laughs> because it was, uh, it was a monstrosity of a thing to edit. Um, but, but it was actually a great, great learning experience. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, I also did it also on two. I, I had a, I start did the first half of it on a computer that was nearly dying, and then did the second half of it on another computer, which was also a weird thing. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was it was, but it was great. And I think that these are you know having, uh, I mean, this was more than basic video editing skills, but having having basic editing skills for both video and audio goes a long way for musicians these days, as we've learned very clearly in this pat in this last year uh but uh so i'm glad that i have the skills that i have i would very much uh, recommend um uh, and if you're an apple mac mac user you get free you know on your computer you have GarageBand and iMovie, so you can you can learn some of these skills and i think that, that it's really helpful so yes i did all the editing awesome are there any other questions coming in or anyone would like to ask personally you can always use the hand raising function. Uh, could you tell us how you got into klezmer as a clarinetist? Uh, I got into it as a as a teenager. I was actually a saxophonist first, which is funny because I told this story to 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 Lori before, right before. Um, I, I came to klezmer on the saxophone when I was young, when I was about fourteen. Um, New York was a great place to get exposed to this music. There was a lot of it going on in the in the mid nineties. Um, was kind of another chapter of the Klezmer revival at that time. Um, and uh, which was uh, in New York and in, I guess in the U.S. in general, that was kind of marked by two things from my opinion at the time. One was all of the stuff that was happening in the downtown New York music scene that crossed paths with Klezmer very regularly. Uh, you know, so you had uh, the, the, the Klezmatics uh, as a group, but all of their offshoots, the projects that Frank London and and, uh, and David Cracker and Alicia Spiegels were doing in New York and working with all of the other, so, many, so much stuff. I could go on and on with names, John Zorn, all that stuff. Tons of stuff was going on there. Simultaneously, there was the uh, It's a Perlman and the Fiddler's House tour was in full force. And I think that I went with my folks to see it at Radio City Music Hall, I believe. Um, uh, and uh, and so that you know, and then I started going to Klez Camp, which is where I met Mark Kligman, uh, and uh, and uh, and a number of other people who were on this uh, on this call. So I yeah, and and, and uh, but the story is coming to clarinet as a in, within that first year, I went to a uh, a workshop that David Krakauer was hosting at Tonic in New York one Sunday afternoon. He was hosting a klezmer workshop, and I went with my saxophone, and at the end. Um, as my parents picked me up from the from the space, he came up to us and he was like, "You should really buy yourself a clarinet." And so my friend Matt Hanovic, who lived around the corner, uh, he had quit clarinet after like fifth grade, and so he had one that was lying around in his garage, and he sold it to me for thirty-five bucks. That's how I got my clarinet. <laughs> um, so. I do see. Um, there's a question here about uh, Clez Canada and yes. and the future of Clez Canada. Would you like to real quickly say, uh, you know, talk a little bit about your teaching with Clez Canada in Yiddish New York and how someone might be able to work with you as a student? Yeah. So uh, I saw there was a couple of questions regarding learning this music, um, and uh, there's great programs, uh, cultural. Yiddish music programs that have been going on for a long time are well established and have proven themselves to be the hubs for uh, cultural transmission and uh, and Yiddish uh, music education. Uh, Klez Canada, the one that I'm currently artistic director for, um, is one is one of them. Um, and uh, this summer we'll be doing a hybrid uh, program that more uh, a bunch of information will be uh, hybrid virtual and. Uh, 
in, in person. Um, uh, more information will be coming out about that in the coming weeks. Um, similarly, Yiddish New York, which happens in the winter, which was really an outgrowth of Klez Camp, which came, uh, which was ran for 30 years in, in the Catskills. Um, and then there's a b whole bunch in Europe and in California, and 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 the stuff that you're doing at uh, UCLA. Uh, take advantage of the people. There's people who want to teach this. There's people who want to pass this on. Uh, there's people who perform it great and have so much to offer. So you just gotta look for it. And and the nice part about this uh, music is that the per the people who play it aren't just kind of scattered on their own. It's a community. It's a nice scene. And people and everyone is is. Uh, is pretty much open and willing. So if there's somebody who whose music you like and excites you and, and you want to learn more about it, just look them up online and get in touch. And and, uh, and it's a very, uh, we're fortunate in that way. Um, uh, I, I will go ahead and say that uh, at UCLA or at UCLA, uh, we have a couple of um, Klezmer workshops coming up uh, with uh, Dan Blacksburg and Deb Strauss. Um, and to keep track of all of that, please either go to our website or join our mailing list, which I believe is somewhere still in the chat. Maybe you can get dropped in there one more time. Uh, let's see. Are there any last questions? Well, with that, I, I just want to quickly uh, acknowledge um, uh, Beth Kramer and Mark Kligman, uh, our, our uh, director and manager. Mark is our director and Beth is our manager and th these programs could not happen without them as well. Uh, at the Lowell Milken Center for Music of the American of American Jewish Experience is the hosting entity, but we also uh, have as our co-sponsor YIVO and we wanna thank them for their support as well. And then finally, Michael, thank you so much for just doing such a wonderful program. Uh, thank you for initially putting on this concert. Thank you for taking us through it in depth and telling us all about what you learned uh, from it. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'm, I'm gonna take this one last moment um, and allow anyone who would like to unmute yourself, feel free and, and give a, uh, a uh, real round of applause. Uh, Thank you very, very much. It was wonderful. So wonderful to hear <laughs> clapping. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Makes my heart right. happy. I'm sorry I have to meet you all again. It's nothing personal. And with <laughs> nothing personal, I, I, you're you're muted too now, Michael. <laughs> We're gonna miss that mute function after. I know. Every, yeah, we're gonna. You're gonna miss that mute function. <laughs> well, with this, uh, with that, a freilichen Ziesen und I guess uh, gesund, uh, gesund Pesach, <laughs> healthy pace. Did I get that right? I think I did. I got close. I, I'll keep trying. But thank you, thank you, and Chag uh, Sameach to everybody. Hope to see you soon. Uh, Take care. Bye, everyone. <laughs>